Welcome to the Spotlight and thanks for joining us. I'm David Rose. Just about every detective I know has a case that's kept them up at night, especially when it's a homicide they just can't crack. But thanks to amazing breakthroughs in science and growing databases of DNA, those cold cases are starting to get cleared more often, sending shivers down the spines of predators everywhere who thought they got away with it. It's also giving hope to the families of victims that they might eventually get justice. Take the disturbing murder in 1995 of Patricia Barnes, for example. Her nude body was found in Kitsap County. She had been shot twice in the head. It was a case that stymied investigators for more than 20 years until Kitsap County Sheriff's Detective Mike Grant solved it, thanks to DNA. On August 25th of 1995, um, some passerbys had found the remains of a deceased female in the 15,000 block of Peacock Hill Road in South Kitsap. Deputies and detectives ultimately responded and found Patricia Barnes. She was identified later through her latent fingerprints and she was discovered to have been shot twice in the head. One thing that really stood out is the detectives found it remarkable that there was uh, kind of mixed um, foliage that was dumped with her body. So it wasn't the Douglas fir and you know the stuff that's native there. But amongst the uh, foliage included what was several cigarette butts. They uh, followed up with the Seattle Police Department and tried to kind of backtrack things to try to recreate uh, her, her situation and who she's with and, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. And they followed up with a number of people who were acquaintances of hers and people that knew her and ultimately the person that had last seen her alive before she had left with an unknown uh, male subject. The witness gave a description to a, a detective who did a, who did a sketch and it has remarkable similarities to the person who was later identified as, as her killer. The case ended up going cold. Uh, there was just kind of a limited social circle. They processed the scene here in Kitsap very thoroughly. It was well done by 1995 standards and it was dealt well done by 2022 standards, to be very honest with you. And I spoke with a number of the detectives who worked the case originally and they, they were honest with me. They said, look, DNA just wasn't that big of a, of a thing. It's not on our mind when we're, when we're processing these crime scenes. But the evidence that they collected proved very valuable when it came to DNA and forensic evidence. We started our own in-house review of all of our cold cases in April of 2018. So my partner, Detective Meyer, and I went through all the evidence. We examined it. We re-entered it into our database went through all of the previous submissions to the State Patrol Crime Lab, and we thought, okay, what, what can we resend? What could be retested? Or what hasn't been tested that we can get some results from? And then we just kind of triage what, what would be most likely to bear fruit. And so initially we submitted a handful of items to the State Patrol Crime Lab. They responded that they had developed a unknown male profile from the evidence that we had submitted. So that was promising because that's the first break. That's the first, okay, we, we have traction. And so based on that, we searched against CODIS, which is just the repository of DNA for people that have been convicted of felonies and, and domestic violence in some cases. And there was no match. And so we're kind of at another dead end. If it wasn't for the funding and the coordination from the Attorney General's office, this would not be here today. It wouldn't have been solved. They connected us with a couple of private labs, and so we reached out to uh, Othram Labs, who does both DNA testing and genetic genealogy follow-up. Within just a few weeks, they had identified their first or second cousin. I got a call on December 22nd, and they said, well, we have a name. And I thought, this is great. This is fantastic. And they said, it's Douglas uh, Crone, unless he has a brother. And as luck would have it, Douglas Crone has a brother. So we had to do more follow-up. That's fine. And so I tracked him down to uh, Nogales, Arizona, and discovered that he had died in 2016, and it was an accident at his house. He and a neighbor were trying to rig up some TV antenna, and of course he put it into the power lines, and he died almost instantly, but his neighbor survived. He was uh, subjected to a autopsy by the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office in Tucson, and they retained biological material, blood evidence, or what have you, just as a matter of course of, of their business. And so we reached out to Pima County. They overnighted me uh, some of the blood from that autopsy. The next day, we sent it to the State Patrol Crime Lab, and about two weeks later, they had confirmed that Douglas Crone's DNA matched 
DNA collected from the evidence that, that strongly suggests that he's responsible for her death. And the linchpin for the evidence was a cigarette butt that was found at the body dump location. The evidence on the body could, could mean one of two, three different things, but when you have a cigarette butt with the DNA and the DNA on her body and on uh, items around her body, it, it was conclusive to me that, that we had the right guy. Realistically, this case was solved in 1995, and it was just a matter of waiting for forensic science and the, uh, the advent of, of genetic genealogy to evolve, and it was just a case waiting to be solved. How they came to meet, nobody knows. Uh, Douglas isn't mentioned in any of the reports. As an acquaintance or a witness or a person of interest, I went through all of the tip logs, and n no one mentioned his name, so it was just a complete uh, random encounter, I would suspect. That lab that he mentioned, Othram, that used familial DNA to identify Douglas Keith Crone, also unraveled two of the longest standing mysteries in Snohomish County, putting names to a pair of John Doe's, bodies that were found in 1980. He just disappeared. No one heard from him. Devastating, heartbreaking, overwhelming trauma. 24-year-old Stephen Lee Knox moved to Everett after getting out of the Air Force in the spring of 1980. His family realized something was wrong after he didn't call or write for four months, something his sister says was completely out of character. In June of that year, a man's body was found in the Snohomish River. The medical examiner's office determined that he drowned and had been submerged for about two months. But since the body was severely decomposed, that's all they could tell. For decades, the body was known as Jetty Doe until a sample was sent to Othram Lab in the Woodlands, Texas. Scientists created a DNA profile and entered it into a genealogy website. The Snohomish County Medical Examiner's Office then built a family tree, leading them to the Knox family. It's been 40 some years, at least we have the confirmation it's him. Stephen's sister says knowing that his remains have been identified means a lot, but there are still more questions to be answered. We just know that there's more pieces that someone else might know. It would be so, so very helpful to my brothers and I if they could provide any more pieces because so many are missing. She says Stephen called her brother with a mysterious message shortly before he went missing. There were bad people after him and if they catch him, they're gonna kill him. But that was my first question to the ME. Was he murdered? And, and they couldn't tell me. All they could say is that he drowned. Janet hopes to learn the full story, but for now, she's thankful she could bring Stephen home. He'll have a space that has his name on it. He's no longer a John Doe. We're taking him, he's ours. Othram also cracked another Snohomish County Doe case, this one tracing back to a gruesome discovery by property owners in Stanwood. They went down to a spring to get some water and they found a skull, a cranium with a hole in the back of its head. The body had been there for weeks and was picked clean. There were bones scattered everywhere. A neighbor's dog had been bringing some of them home. Detectives got right to work on the case, making a clay model of the skull and creating a dental mold. They weren't able to generate many leads, though, or identify who the person was. In 2011, Detective Jim Scharf with the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office applied for a warrant to have the body exhumed so that a DNA sample could be retrieved. Four different labs in the country have made nine total attempts to get DNA from these bones. And Othram Lab finally got a DNA profile. And we used genetic genealogy to give us a good tip that it's probably remains of the son of a man named Samuel Chambers. Well, it just so happens that Samuel Chambers has a son named Ronald Chambers who was listed as a missing person in King County from 1979. Detectives matched military dental records to Chambers and made a positive ID, then went back to the 1979 missing persons case file and discovered a crazy story. Chambers was staying in a motel with his wife and infant son. He left with a buddy named Robert Helberg on December 17, 1978. They said they were heading for Everett. Chambers never returned, but Helberg did and told the wife, 
a hitman killed Chambers. She got around to filing a police report after the new year. We believe that Robert Helberg is the person responsible. He's also a person of interest in another jurisdiction for a couple of other homicides. Helberg died in federal prison in 1993. While he would never stand trial, at least Chambers loved ones know what happened. Before scientists developed techniques to use DNA to map a person's genealogical profile, unidentified human remains almost always stayed that way. Until now, only 1% of unidentified murder victims were identified using the FBI's CODIS database. Since most weren't criminals, there was no DNA sample in the database to compare to. The technology to identify someone from blood or other evidence from decades ago is being used right now by scientists at Othram, where they are getting justice through genomics for victims in our state. Othram is the only lab in the world that is purpose-built to use forensic genomics to, to get inputs from intractable forensic evidence and identify perpetrators and victims from crime scenes. We're looking to dissociate DNA from that evidence. So maybe we have some skeletal remains, maybe it's a blood stain. So we want to take that material and we do what's called a DNA extraction. So we're trying to dissociate the DNA molecules from whatever else is there. That's one step. And then the other step is that once we can do that, we want to read that DNA. You can imagine when you find a body out in the wilderness, um, that body is in bad condition. There's a lot of non-human DNA with it. It's decomposed, sometimes it's burned. I mean, there's, we've worked with all sorts of remains. And we're able to take those intractable inputs and create a DNA profile that looks like a DNA profile that would come out of a swab from your mouth or your blood today. We've worked um, from 0.12 nanograms of DNA for a sex assault murder of a 14-year-old girl in Las Vegas. 0.12 nanograms is equivalent to 15 human cells. So if I touch my hand right now, I've left hundreds of cells. So less than this from 32 years ago of a mixture between perpetrator and victim, and we were able to identify that perpetrator. There is no other lab that does this. We have this uh, instrument, it's called the Nova Seek 6000. It's uh, manufactured by a company called Illumina. It's about the size of a washing machine. This is the most powerful sequencer in the world. It's got the highest scale, highest quality. Um, there's just nothing bigger and better than it. So you take DNA that you've isolated from some forensic evidence, and then what we do is we, we build a library of those molecules. So we get a bunch of those molecules that are little fragments that in total represent kind of the entirety of that DNA, which people call someone's genome. And from that library, um, we actually use a, what's called a flow cell. It's like a little glass surface. And we distribute essentially all these little fragments of DNA all over this flow cell. And each little fragment of DNA gets stuck somewhere. This is a process that's called sequencing by synthesis. We take one strand of DNA and DNA is double stranded. So we take one strand and you literally in vitro in the machine build the complementary strand. And as you're building the strand, you have little color labels, fluorescent labels that essentially tell you what letters being added on. And so what this machine does, it's got a giant camera and it's taking photographs of every step of you building a DNA molecule, one letter at a time. And it takes a bunch of pictures and these pictures can then be deconvoluted to tell you what letter was added. So you put all these little molecules on there and you can read what the letters of these molecules are by essentially indirectly measuring what the letter is when you synthesize the, the strand next to it. We upload our DNA profiles to genealogical databases that are purpose-built for law enforcement use, like ours, DNA Solves, or ones that have been um, consented for law enforcement purposes. And then we are able to fit that piece back to where it belongs on a family tree. So we'll know that there's a match that this is this far away here, and a match that's this far away here, and a match that's this far away here. And then we can figure out exactly where that person fits in that genealogical tree and give you the identity of the person that was at the crime scene. If you've left DNA at a crime scene, you're already caught. We're just working our way to you. For our technology, you don't have to be in any database. Everyone is interrelated enough to the databases that exist right now have enough people in them that you don't have to be in it. None of the relatives you know or come to Thanksgiving have to be in it. And, and you're still able to be identified. And that's, that's the amazing part of the technology is we can identify anyone. And I think you'll, you'll witness the extinction of repeat crime 
Um, it'll become harder and harder to, you know, there won't be serial killers. It'll be hard to be a serial predator because ideally after the first time that you leave DNA evidence, you'll be identified. I think this is where cold cases come to, to go into extinction. The big picture, I think there's probably a lot of people that are going to be getting knocks at the doors. Right now, Othram says they charge $5,000, but only if they produce a profile that solves the case. If not, no charge. And most of the money goes towards overhead, things like chemicals, lab techs, and machines. And they're working with several states and the FBI. When they build a DNA profile of a suspect, they enter that information into the national database. It's easy to lose sight of the human aspect of police investigations, but they take a huge toll on families and the detectives working the case, especially when it's the murders of children. Retired Tacoma cold case detective Lindsay Wade recounts how working on a case that scared her when she was a child helped influence her decision to go into law enforcement. When we talk about cold cases, I like to call them murder mysteries because they're not cold. I mean, you worked on Jennifer Bastian's case for, for years. You were actively working on that. Um, how satisfying is that for an investigator? Working on these cases, when everybody else is out doing the homicide of the week, you know, and then after all those years, you get justice for a victim. What's that like? It's really indescribable. Um, I would love to be able to put it in words, but it's really hard to because um, it it's almost like a, it, an adrenaline rush, but then kind of unbelievable. Like, wait a minute, after all these years, even though it's like you're working towards this goal, in the back of my mind, I was just thinking like, this is crazy. This is craziness. Um, it's like a needle, trying to find a needle in a haystack. Um, you know, in Jennifer's case, we had over 2,300 names, uh, you know, male names in the case file. And so it's like, how do you, how are we going to find 2,300 people and get their DNA? <laughs> so, um, you know, there were many days when I would go in and look at all those notebooks and just think this is, I, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like I should just move on to something else because this is crazy. And I'm just kind of like wearing myself down mentally. <laughs> um, but then, you know, I would, I would just remember, well, you know, this is my job and it, actually it's not about me. And, you know, I was just sort of hell bent on trying to find the answer. It was a cold case for 32 years. And, um, you know, I think that case had a nice mix of good old fashioned police work uh, coupled with some new age technology and, you know, cutting edge uh, genealogy work. And I think the fact that, um, you know, I developed a pretty close relationship with Jennifer's mom probably had something to do with it as well because she was, despite everything she had been through, she was just so positive and um, just never seemed like she gave up hope. And so it's like, well, she can, you know, feel that way and she can still be positive and still contribute, then, you know, I have nothing to complain about. I can't even imagine what that phone call was like uh, when you told her. I showed up at her doorstep at 7 a.m and told her right after the arrest was made. And yeah, it was pretty. She probably took one look at your face and knew there was some better news. Yeah. 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 That's a different kind of a visit that you get to make to a family, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you think there are a lot of guys out there who have committed heinous murders like Jennifer Bastian's murder, Michella Welch's murder, who then didn't go on to become serial killers or be caught up in, in other crimes, who just did it one and done and then and then moved on. Because if that if there are a lot of them, that's pretty terrifying. I, I think, yes, I think um, the cases that are being solved around the country with genealogy are telling us just that. Um, I think there have been over 200 cases solved now uh, with genealogy, cold cases that are 20, 30 years old, 40 years old. And what these cases are telling us is that most of these offenders didn't have any criminal history. And um, you know, which is why they never showed up on anybody's radar in the first place. And they're not being connected to multiple cases. It's one. Last week on the spotlight, we told you about the massive effort underway to collect lawfully owed DNA from thousands of convicted felons here in our state who have avoided submitting samples to the FBI's national database. Here's why it's so important. We got some great news this week from King County Sheriff Sergeant Jason Escobar. Level one sex offender Mitchell Lalas agreed to provide a DNA sample when deputies contacted him. That sample was a match to a home invasion rape of a 15 year old girl in San Diego back in 1998. She's willing to testify now, so deputies cuffed Lalas 
and extradited him to California this week, where tonight he's sitting in jail on more than a million dollars bail waiting to face trial. That's all the time we have for this edition of The Spotlight. Until next week, be smart and stay safe.